about uh, what we should teach, you're the wrong audience in one way to speak to because um, you're all enthusiasts. And I'm afraid the people that prescribe fluids are far from enthusiasts. They're all the, um, really the FY1, the uh, foundation year one doctors whose heart falls, sinks, when a nurse trots up to them and says, will you please write up some more fluids? And that's really what I'm going to be uh, talking out ab about as our target or, um, of our, of our te teaching. So I'm going to extend the, um, the remit a little bit and uh, look at um, who should be taught. I've ta said that. We really should make sure that junior doctors know what they're doing, what gets taught, who decides what's taught. Well, um, that mainly, if you speak to students, they'll always say, is this going to be in the exams? And if it is, then they start to learn about it. If they, you tell them, no, this is just out, out of interest, they, they promptly forget it. Um, who makes sure that it's up to par? Well, if the examination system is working correctly, then the examiners should be testing. And it's very interesting to hear earlier on how as soon as you start to step out of the normal line, then you probably get dumped as an examiner. Um, how is teaching translated into practice? And I've told you who does the prescribing, it's junior doctors. What are our attitudes to new knowledge? We've already seen successive speakers today talking about the way our um, information base has changed. I'm going to just take two examples and I'm not going to use them as um, factual evidence but just as the way that evidence alters. Early study in goal-directed therapy um, showed a remarkable difference in the 28-day mortality, probably not the right time to look at it, 40 deaths um, in the intervention group compared with 61 in the control group and they concluded that early goal-directed therapy is significantly useful. Now, I'm not going to argue about the science, but I'm just going to say that later on this year, th th this year we've had a, another study showing at goal-directed resuscitation therapy in which there was really very little difference between the two groups, although both groups, of course, had a very much better um, uh, survival rate than they did in that early study. Part of this is almost certainly what's called the winner's curse. Produce a small study and you might strike lucky, try to, re to repeat it in a larger study and it's very likely that you're going to find you've overestimated the effect. Another uh, guideline, um, if we were trying to teach about g using um, blood transfusion to our um, uh, junior doctors, we might go to uh, this guideline, evidence level 1B, pretty good really, not too bad at all, but then we get another study coming in um, uh, this year again which showed really very little difference in outcome depending on whether you aim for a higher or a lower haemoglobin threshold in patients with sepsis. So what gets taught? Well, it's the clever story that usually hits the textbooks and, st and stays there. Let's look at how medical knowledge develops. We're going along and suddenly somebody makes a, a interesting discovery. Somebody else then does a small size um, clinical study which comes out positive, so we all start to use it, but the, the sort of levels of concern build up a little bit, so somebody else does another study which shows that there's not such a good an effect, and the subsequent result um, is that uh, that particular therapy loses favour. Where does it get into the books? Well, it probably gets into the books about here, and if we're lucky, it gets taken out of the books a bit later on, but that's not necessarily always the case. Osler's famous textbook of medicine um, suggested that bloodletting was good for patients with pneumonia, written about 1880 or something like that. It stayed in his book until 1931. Where is the information? Let's look at the books. Uh, we looked at 29 books, ranging from the very uh, respected books like Stanley Davidson's Principle and Practice of Medicine, as far as uh, fluids for dummies. We found um, 29 books that an undergraduate might be willing to pick up and read, and we asked each book to answer 26 questions on topics such as normal fluid balance, um, intake and out output, um, distribution of blood volume and so on, 
effects of surgery on fluid <coughs> balance, the assessment of hyper and hypovolemia, the treatments that were available, and the content of common fluids. We didn't look at what they actually said because we thought that that would allow us, we, we would have to then make a judgment. All we did was say whether it was actually in the book at all, whether it was mentioned, or whether it was well covered. So a pretty simple categorical um, judgment of, of that. What we find was that the scores of the books they could, the maximum possible score was 52, the median was 10. So pretty grim coverage of these books, which as you'd expected should have all have been up there. I'm not telling you what that book is, how it would embarrass the, the, the editor, but it was a multi-author uh, uh, textbook which had input from anaesthetists, and I think that's probably what made the difference. The questions ranged from the impossible to the relatively well answered. Um, these are the marks that each of the questions got. These were the ones about volume loss and they were answered rather better than the ones about routine maintenance. So there's something missing. Now why is it missing? How can you tell something's missing? You need to know there's a hole there before you can find it if you like. The problem with textbooks is they're written by experts and experts miss the obvious and the mundane because they're experts. They, what, that, that stuff is, is routine to them so they don't bother about it. They concentrate on the exciting and the arcane rather than the, than the obvious. If you're writing a textbook, I remember writing a chapter once and the first thing I said to myself was, well, I better see what people have written about this before. And that's fine as guidance about what has been written about, but you miss completely what has not been written about. Most textbooks like to present a nice story, something that hangs together has got a sort of a, 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 a theory that, that supports it. And when books are reviewed, they're frequently reviewed after dinner with a glass of whiskey, oh God, I better review this textbook, and you don't set yourself a proper task to look through and see what is missing. You should really write a recipe. If I was going to do, write a book about this, I would like to see these things covered. And that's not done. So reviewers often are very uh, dismissive or don't, don't appreciate that something's missing. It gets worse. Um, examiners are generally eminent and enthusiastic volunteers who have a special interest but then they're told usually by the examination board that they're not allowed to ask questions on that because that would be too difficult for the candidates. They have to ask fair questions and a fair question is one that's got the answer, if it's right, in the textbook. Um, the candidates expect and are expecting to give a positive and factual response. I was criticised very badly uh, by um, my uh, medical teaching organisation by saying that we should have some factitious illnesses in the finals. A third of patients who turn up in hospital outpatient clinics with chest pain, headache, abdominal pain have nothing physically wrong with them at all. But that was supposed to be a really you know, nasty thing to do to medical students because they're supposed to find positive illnesses. So all of these are recipes for conservatism and getting things wrong. If we look at undergraduate examinations, the story gets even worse than that. Miller's Pyramid is, a, is beloved of medical educationalists. Um, it, he, he described it properly in this, in this publication, but it, you see it in, in many, many textbooks. This idea that textbook knowledge is fine, but it's not the important parts. It's important to know how to show and to actually do things. Well, that's true. But we now have examinations which concentrate on this bit of the pyramid by a very artificial system of examination. I've watched a, many medical students carefully listen to the chest. And as long as they do it, they pass. Sometimes we get them to answer uh, questions about fluid therapy the same way. If they can write and sign, they pass. You know, and we often say to them when you're in, in, in a prescribing thing, imagine a situation in which there's blood all over the floor, the patient's got their legs in the air, they've already sent off 
blood for uh, cross-matching, now write a prescription for fluids. Now, that's easy, isn't it? Because you've been told what to do. But if you don't have the basic knowledge, it's pretty difficult to get that right in clinical practice. We surveyed uh, uh, foundation year doctors throughout the UK, pretty impressive response rate. It wasn't up to me, it was, my, uh, it was the, these people that did, did that. And they found, we found that their confidence in prescribing was pretty middle of the road. I would have hoped that they were pretty confident with a five rating, but they weren't. And their knowledge was again pretty, uh, pretty, pretty average as well. So in reality, when the FY1 gets kicked out into the ward, this all starts to crumble because their basic background knowledge, even if it were adequately provided by textbooks, is, um, is, is, uh, is pretty shaky. So we've heard about the NICE guidelines, and it's a start, and it actually starts at the right end of the spectrum. It starts with a very basic maintenance fluid therapy. It goes on to talking about replacement of excessive losses, like from nasogastric aspirates or uh, fistula losses, uh, diarrhea and things like that, and then finally gets around to talking about resuscitation. So I'm missing out the resuscitation bit. I'm really talking about these things, which is these are the things that our um, junior doctors have to be able to do adequately. And uh, it should be based on clinical experience and not knee-jerk. The trouble with the knee-jerk is that they've been all told, generally, that saline is safe. You could, if, if someone's looking a bit sick, give them a bag of saline, this sort of thing. Um, we did a survey in Lothian. Lothian's got three major hospitals. Um, we put all the data together. We found that patients were being pickled. They're getting two and a half times the amount of sodium per 24 hours that they should be getting according to the NICE guidelines. And there's this immunity to established practice, which would be a very useful thing to teach people, because unless we can get our um, new cohort of people who are trained adequately into practice and able to do things without being influenced by this comment, you know, do as the Romans do, do the same thing. We don't have that fluid on the ward because the doctors last year all prescribed saline. You're going to have a lot of problems. This is a holiday snap of mine. Um, it's uh, in the Peloponnese, just sort of the, to the east of Kalamata. Um, that's where Greece took a rather large meteorite strike. Okay, a pretty big hole actually. That's a small agricultural building there uh, used for accommodating sheep. So you can see it's a big hole. And um, that's, as Nice says, what our knowledge about fluid therapy is like. A Nice report suggested outcome-based studies, lots of them, sat on the fence because there were no RCTs and ignored the weak signals which have been very well already summarized to you, the um, propensity sort of base studies which suggested that, that, that excessive chloride wasn't very good for you. Well, if books are no good and NICE isn't much of a help, can you try something else? Everybody says nowadays the web is the source of all information. So I went to one uh, website Anesthesia UK, which claims to be an educational site, it mentioned very promptly, when you look at the fluids, the colloid crystalloid controversy, a bit unfair to, 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 it's like shooting fish in a barrel, really. Um, they said the controversy, the, the website was created in 2005. They said the best summary of the controversy was a 1991 wor workshop. And Surprise, surprise, nothing of what we've heard today was in, on, uh, in, in that account of fluid therapy at all. We're busy trying to introduce NICE compliance into, into Lothian. We, um, I read the uh, intro, well, the, the, there was a sort of an early um, publication of, of the NICE guidelines before the final guidelines came out. The final ones were held up because of the colloid uh, problems. Um, and so that's why we had our audit done really about the same time as NICE issued their guidance. And we're trying to introduce, introduce simple didactive, didactic uh, guidance based on NICE, but a little more firm, if you like, than NICE. It's not comprehensive because we say all the time, if there's a problem, call for help. The basics of maintain, replace, resuscitate are introduced in that order because, as I've said before, People often, when they're teaching, like to concentrate on the exciting, complicated stuff, and they 
maybe mention that on the last slide or something like that, and that's not the right way to do it. We've produced a booklet to give to our junior doctors, which will go in their pocket, and we'll cover it all in essentially one side of A4. It's folded up so that it doesn't look like a, like a sheet of A4, but that's where it is. We've altered the pharmacy order list for the wards so that the right fluids will be available, and we're starting to change fluid balance charts and prescription charts so that students will, so that junior doctors will have to engage their brain before they start to prescribe. For example, this is actually, since this week we've changed a bit because it was a bit busy really, but the checklist, it's like a checklist for airline pilots and so on and so forth, they've got to do that first to get the prescription valid. So. The, 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 the new one is going to say volume status, ring one of these, hypovolemic, euvolemic or hypervolemic, ring one of these, does the patient need resuscitation, replacement, maintenance or restriction? And then if restriction is indicated, what volume are you aiming to restrict it to? We modified the um, NICE algorithm, uh, made it very didactic, said 500 mils of Plasmalite 148, okay, so low, relatively low chloride and no um, calcium so that it could be used in, uh, in, 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 in circumstances where you may be considering giving blood as well and stop after 2,000 mils. If the things haven't got better by then, the junior doctor has to look for extra help. So in conclusions, keep it simple, pay attention to the information we do have, go and look at the patient look at the fluid balance chart, see if they've got blood going through their fingers, this sort of thing. Change the culture, because the culture at the moment is that it's a routine task which you can't make a mess of. And we know, this audience anyway, knows that it's terribly easy to make a mess of. Engage the brain, and we've tried to avoid as much of the controversy as we can. There may be controversy, but for junior doctors, keep it simple, stupid. Okay, thank you very much.